come to those who wait. We have been waiting all week for this moment, and a good thing has come to us. There's another expression that good things come in small packages. Psalm 87, I would suggest to you, is a small package, but yet a very good one. Are you turning there in your Bible? <laughs> Psalm 87, praise for Zion, for Zion, much like the song that we sang at the beginning of our worship service. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Several characteristics of Zion. Pride and chosen. Zion is chosen, and you can tell from the onset of this psalm, the opening tone is that of being proud of the city of God. You notice that Zion, although a mountain, in this poem is actually talking about the city of God being a city. The city of God being on mountain, on the Mount Zion, is why it's referred to as Zion. God chose Zion, and this is something that will cause Zionists, if you will, to be full of pride. Consider Psalm 68. So put a marker in Psalm 87. I think this is the only time we'll turn out of it. Psalm 68. Verse 15 says, A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. If you have a footnote, the first mountain there can be translated, maybe in some of your versions, is a mighty mountain. A mighty mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. So to understand what's going on here, I know you can't read much of that, but up here is Mount Hermon. This is the mountain range of Mount Bashan. There are three peaks in it that are 9,200 feet above sea level. This is the tallest mountain range in all of Syria, including down in this area. In fact, I have read from several sources that from the Dead Sea, you can see that mountain range. Now here's the deal. This mountain range is quite a bit bigger than Mount Zion. In fact, there's a big difference there. Now, the idea in Psalm 68 is that of envy. For example, thinking from a human perspective, if you were going to choose a mountain to be your home, would you choose one that's 2,500 feet tall or one that's 9,200 feet tall, whose height is obscured by the clouds very often? In fact, Mount Olympus is 9,500 feet tall. Look in verse 15. A mountain, or a mighty mountain of God, is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Now listen. Why do you look with envy, O mountains, with many peaks, at the mountain which God has desired? Do you see what's going on there? These, these tall mountains up here are looking down and saying, God, why didn't you choose, you chose that little mountain down there? And so from the perspective of the little mountain, yes, God chose me. God chose us. Isn't that something to be prideful about? Of all the mountains in the world and all the mountains of Judah, God chose us. The idea could be the nations that stand behind or above those nations 
are looking down, excuse me, the nations that stand above the mountains, are looking down. Look in verse 17. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. The idea is, look, God was down here. God took Israel. Of all the nations in the world, God took Israel from Sinai and brought them up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Mount Zion, Israel, that's God's chosen people, not anybody else. And from their perspective, God chose us. And be prideful of that, if you will, in Psalm 87. Psalm 87. Two more characteristics. Number one is stability, and that goes hand in hand with being established by God. Psalm 87 verse 1 says in the New American Standard and most of your versions will read something like this. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The ESV reads this way. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. That's the idea. He founded this city. The rest of our versions will actually keep the word order in the original, which is emphatic. He founded this city. And the city that God founds isn't going anywhere. In verse 5, the Most High himself will establish her. Yeah, when God establishes a city, it doesn't go anywhere. It's stable. So Mount Zion, Jerusalem, had its mighty men, sure. And it had, here's a, here's a map. If you look, you can see this area right here. It's a very steep ascent up to the city. In fact, that's what made this such a hard city to conquer, even in David's day, because of these, these hill slopes. And on top of the hill, they built fortresses, the stronghold of David. So I know this map is from quite a bit further ahead in time than that we're dealing with here, but it'll make the point. So Herod builds this wall. Titus comes in A.D. 70. Now understand this, that Vespasian is now ruling, and Vespasian had been in Syria, in this area, and he knew of all the chaos and all the trouble that the Jews were stirring up as they wanted to rebel from Rome. And his singular purpose, with all the resources of the Roman Empire, right now his singular purpose was to destroy this city. So he brings 40,000 troops, Roman troops alone. That doesn't count the ones on the horses. That doesn't count the ones from the other vassal kings. Roman troops alone, 40,000 of them, he brings to this. It took him 15 days to smash through that outer wall. It took him three days while he's doing this to build a wall, a rock wall, around the entire city. It took him 15 days to get through these walls. Then when he got through that wall, it took him another nine days to get through that wall. And then when he got through that wall there at the temple, they had walls there. When he started, he said, I'm never going to get through this, and he burned down the gates instead. That's when God allowed him to take the city and get my drift here. That's when God allowed it. Because God, at one time, had established Zion. And as long as God was in control, nobody was going to overcome it. They wouldn't even, they couldn't, they couldn't do anything to Zion, no less overcome it when God is in control. In Psalm 87, verse 2, two more characteristics of this Zion. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. Talking about the thing for the thing contained. God doesn't love literally the gates around Zion. He loves what the, the gates are protecting, the people inside. More than all the other dwelling places in Jacob. Get that. There are other dwelling places, and God loves them. But guess who, guess who God loves the most? God loves Zion the most. There's something special about this Zion. It's chosen. It's special to God. And then, Zion is glorious. Glorious 
things are spoken of you. Actually, it's this. Spoken of you are some things. And in verse 4, he'll start to, there, there's, he uses a technical term here, and he'll, it's like a decree. He's reading a decree. Things are spoken of you in verse 3. Some of them are in verse 4, 5, and 6. But the first one is in verse 3. Glorious things of you are spoken. I find it interesting that this is the word that is more often than not used of God. God is the glorious one. When they came out of Egypt, Miriam was dancing. This word is not used, but she's saying glorious things about God. Mary, when she finds out that she's pregnant, glorious things come out of her mouth about God. I find it interesting here that this word that was more often than not used of God is here used of the city. The Queen of Sheba, turn over to 1 Kings chapter 10. Verse 1, when the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. So there's two things going on here. She wants to be impressed by, or will be impressed by, his wisdom and also, also his wealth. She came to Jerusalem with a very large retinue, with camels carrying spices, with very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. Her heart. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was hidden from the king, which he did not explain to her. When the queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house which he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the attendants of his waiters and their attire, his cupbearers, his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord. Even the stairs are impressive to this woman. There was no more spirit in her. She's, she's the queen of Sheba. That's a pretty big deal. When she comes here, she says, man, I've got nothing compared to this. Verse 6, she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in my own land about the words of your wisdom. You see, other people are talking about it, aren't they? About Solomon, his wisdom, and all that he has. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came in my eyes and seen it. Behold, not the half was told to me. Wow. Look at this city, this wonderful, glorious city. Some of the things about this city, it is a community, not a place. We see that actually here, right? Glorious things are thee are spoken. I just quoted the psalm, which is a quote of the psalm. O city of God. It's talking about a city. It's talking about the people. It's talking about a community, not so much a place. It is a community of all nations. I shall mention Rahab, which is a reference, a veiled reference to Egypt and Babylon. Among those who know me, behold, Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia, this one was born there. You see, this, this city that we're talking about is actually a city... Of all the nations, these are some representations of these nations. Notice, they know me. They don't just fear the Lord. They don't just have heard the Lord's name and fear him. These know the Lord. In fact, they're born there. Three times this will be repeated. Verse 5. But of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself will establish her. Verse 6. The Lord will count when he registers the peoples. This one was born there. In the New Testament, these are not just, as we call, proselytes. Do you remember Paul in Acts chapter 20, 21, 22, I think? When he's being stretched, they're ready to rip, whip him. And he says to the centurion, are you going to whip a Roman citizen? The centurion says, oh no, it goes back to his commander. The commander comes up to him and says, I bought my citizenship. And Paul says what? I was born. These people have the privilege of being born in the kingdom. Notice, this is a community of former enemies now living together peacefully. You see that? Rahab standing for Egypt. The Philistine, look at the Babylon. These are all former enemies who are now living together in peace. Zion's glory is both in its king and its citizens. Verse 7. Zion's citizens praise Zion, the city of joy. Then those who sing as well as those who play the flutes. Now if you have a verb in here, it's added. 
In the original, there's no shall say, there's no will say. It's just, they jump right, you remember, you've seen this little children who are so excited, they just can't wait to say it, they blurt it out. That's what's going on here. They, he, the singers don't even wait for the author to finish the sentence, and they're saying, all oh, my springs of joy are in you. I love this city, the inhabitants are saying. Compare Isaiah 2. We're done with Psalm 87 for now. Isaiah 2. There are other passages in the Old Testament that talk about this same place. Isaiah 2, which is exactly the same as Micah 4. Isaiah 2, the word of Isaiah, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It will come about that in the last days. Here we have a time indicator time reference, which I didn't mention this, but the verbs in verse 5, Zion is of Zion it will be said I'm sorry, the most high himself will establish her. The Lord will count when he registers the peoples. This is future tense from Psalm 87. Here in Isaiah 2 it will come about in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as chief of the mountains. We're hearing the same language that we heard in Psalm 87. It will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us concerning his ways that he, we, and that we may walk in his paths for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he will judge between nations and will render decisions between many peoples and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks A nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. No, not when they're citizens of that place. You've got these foreign nations living peacefully together. It's the same kind of language. Notice, these people love his law. They say in verse 2, all the nations are streaming to it. You can picture this. The refugees as they're walking along, crowds, masses of them. Verse 3, many peoples will come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Note this also. The law is going from Zion, not Sinai. This is talking about a new day, a new law, a different time, a different place. Isaiah 35, turn over to. Isaiah 35, verse 3, encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Hey, that sounds great. I'll take some of that. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. This sounds a lot like Isaiah chapter 2, which is right. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. I'll, I'll pause just to say this. You know that this is what Jesus quotes when John comes to him and says, are you really the Messiah, the one we're looking for? And Jesus quotes this verse and says, yes. My simple point right now is this has been fulfilled. When Jesus came... Verse 6, then the lame will leak like deer, the tongue of the mute will shout for joy, the waters will break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the Arabah, the scorched land will become a pool, the thirsty ground springs of water, in the haunt of jackals its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes, a highway will be there, a roadway, it will be called a highway of holiness, the unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will be any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. It's the same language as the psalm that we read. Notice, these people are redeemed and ransomed. Another word for forgiven. That's what we're talking about here. They're not unclean. They don't have the sin still attached to them. No. They're people who have been forgiven of their sins. For the next passage, I want us to note from here, verse 9 says, no lion will be there, nor any vicious beast. I'm going to say to you that this is not literal. There won't be any literal lions there. It's using figurative language. No lion is here in this passage. But the one we're about to go to, there is a lion, although he is not 
vicious. Watch. Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, verse 1. The shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. The branch from his roots will bear fruit. So in Zechariah chapter 6, the Lord promises that the one who will build the temple in the future is called the branch, a reference to Jesus. So in chapter 11, it starts talking about Jesus, but in verse 6, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will, dwell, will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, and the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox, the nursing child will play like a uh, play by the hole of the cobra, the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. You see these animals that are no longer by nature doing what they would do by nature? They've changed. They're no longer ferocious. No, they've heard the knowledge of the Lord. And thanks be to God, they've changed because of that. Verse 10. In that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse and will stand as a signal for their free peoples and his resting place will be glorious. That is quoted in Romans chapter 15 by Paul. And the point I'm trying to make right now is we know that this passage has been fulfilled. So we have Psalm 87. We've got Isaiah 2, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 11. Now, Joel chapter 2. And this will be the last Old Testament passage for now. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, it will come about after this. Now, I know I'm jumping into the middle of the context, but you're Bible students, and you can go home and read more about the context. The reason why I'm jumping in here, as you already know, is because <clears throat> Peter in Acts chapter 2 starts quoting right here, and he says, not it'll come about after this, but in the last days, which is the same language that we have up there in Isaiah chapter 2, right? It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Peter in Acts 2 is quoting all of this. I will display wonders in the sky, on the earth, blood and fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. But it will come about after that, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. My whole point in turning to these places is that they sound exactly like Psalm 87. And we understand that from these passages, oh, guess what? This is fulfilled. And I can go to the New Testament. I can see, look them up later. You can see where the inspired author says, these two, this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the same thing. <laughs> now, there are similar passages in the New Testament. Compare Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews 12, the author is telling them you need to be peaceful people. Well, that sounds like everything we've been reading so far. Verse 14. Pursue peace with all men. Okay. Why? Verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, into a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a whirlwind. And he's talking about Mount Zion. Excuse me. There, he's talking about Mount Sinai. You haven't come, you haven't come there. No. If you had come there and you had disobeyed, that's bad enough. That's Hebrews chapter 2, right? 1 and 2 and 3, that's what you can study in. Verse 22, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. Notice the word church there? Huh, he's been talking about the church the whole time. The church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Do you remember it said in Psalm 87 that he, God, registers those who are born there? Here's a general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God. And to the judge of all, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That sounds like what we've been talking about. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Matthew 16. More language that we'll recognize. Jesus asks 
Peter and others, where does everybody say I am? Peter says in verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and listen, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. That's the opposite of what was stated in Psalm 87. In Psalm 87, I love the gates of Zion, and I established it, so it's never going to go away. Here, you have another place. So you have the gates of Zion over here. And here you have the gates of Haiti. In Psalm 87, these gates will never go away. In Matthew chapter 16, these gates will never beat up those gates. What is he talking about? He's talking about his church. Acts chapter 2. Oh, by the way, on the way through to Acts chapter 2, stop into John 3. Remember, three times, one, two, three times it had repeated that they will be born in that city. Remember a Pharisee named Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus and he says, you're a great teacher. And Jesus says, you need to be born again to enter the kingdom. Well, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a Jew. He thinks he's right into the kingdom. He's a Pharisee. That's doubly in the kingdom. And Jesus says to him, guess what? That's not enough. John 3.3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. So we end up in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, they speak, the apostles and the Holy Spirit. They speak tongues. Some people say, what does this mean? In verse 16, Peter says, this was what was spoken to the prophet Joel. I just read that right here. You know the text. Peter says, this is evidence that the one you killed is in heaven reigning right now. And they hear this, they're pierced to the heart, and they say, what do we do? And Peter says, repent, each one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had been, excuse me, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. I wonder who did the add. Verse 47, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So here we have this church, which is Mount Zion. They're born into it, and the Lord, who keeps a register, is adding to this body here. In chapter uh, chapter 5, we'll read in verse 14, more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men, were constantly added to their number. But in verse 11, it said, great fear came over the whole church. In other words, very simply put, all of this is talking about what the New Testament calls over and over again, the church. Two warnings. The first one, there are some who say that the kingdom of Christ has not yet been set. They're reading out of some other book. Here's another one. There are some who say that the Old Testament has, does not speak of the time of the church. They're not reading out of the same Old Testament. The first is not reading out of the same New Testament that I am. The second is not reading out of the same Old Testament. Just be aware of that and go to your scripture and read these. Become more familiar with it and you'll understand, no, there's a prevalent doctrine out there that says both of these things and they're both wrong. And familiarity with your Old and New Testament. Oh, by the way, notice this. How perfectly the Old and New Testaments fit together. Having trouble understanding the New Testament? Go to the Old. Having trouble understanding the Old? Go to the New. And read them both together, and you come away and you say, wow, I've been enlightened. Some observations. Number one, what a church. We have what no one else has 
Remember, the whole Psalm 87 starts off with, God founded this church. And it ends with, those who are in this slice of church, God founded Zion. It ends with the citizens of Zion praising the city itself. We are the ones who have what no one else has. We have access to God. We have all spiritual blessing. We do. And I'm not trying to disparage anybody else. I'm trying to encourage them to get into Mount Zion because we have what it is. We have all spiritual blessings. A couple things to read. Number one, a bar is the title. A bar. The name of each saloon is bar. The fittest of its names by far. A bar to heaven, a door to hell. Whoever named it, named it well. A bar to manliness and wealth, a door to want and broken health. A bar to honor, pride, and fame, a door to grief and sin and shame. A bar to hope, a bar to prayer, a door to darkness and despair. A bar to honored, useful life, a door to brawling, senseless strife. A bar to all that's true and brave, a door to every drunkard's grave. A bar to joys that home in parts, a door to tears and aching hearts. A bar to heaven, a door to hell, whoever named it, named it well. I was sitting at Tillman Tire not too long ago, and next to a young man who's about 10 years younger than I am, and he said to me that the night before, his son had taken a picture of him drunk on the couch, like he always is. Showed him it the next morning. Said, hey, Daddy. He said, I don't remember taking that, you taking that picture. And his son said, as though it happens all the time, oh, you were drunk. That man is looking for something in the bottom of a glass. And that's what Satan wants. Satan wants us, and it could be alcoholism, it can be anything. I'm just reading this one thing. Satan wants us to look at this and not the church. He wants us to think, oh, you'll find it here, and that's not where it is. Everything is in the church. Why would you look away from that? Darwinism. Don't be discouraged, poor little fly. You'll be a chipmunk, chipmunk, by and by. And years after I can see, you'll be a full-grown chimpanzee. Next I see with a prophet's ken, you'll take your place in the ranks of men. Then in the great sweet by and by, we'll be angels, you and I. Why should I swat you, poor little fly? Because in Darwinism, there's no difference between a fly and a monkey and the rest of us animals. What a sad, sad, pitiful, pitiful life. <coughs> we have blessing upon blessing <coughs> in the church. We have access to God. We are loved by God. We are special to God. We are glorious. We are forgiven. So the first was entertainment. The second was non-religion. Here's false religion. I won't tell you the church. Back to school blessing. Bring your school stuff to church for prayers of blessing, dedication, and commitment. Exclamation point. Things you might bring could include book bag, books, notebooks, pens, pencils, etc. Class schedule, teacher's names, etc. Gym shorts, shoes, shoes, game gear. Free Crayolas for younger children and composition or single theme notebooks for older kids and teens. And that's all they got to offer. How pathetic. We have God. We have forgiveness. We have people walking around 
who used to act one way, but because of the knowledge of the Lord and their commitment to it and their faith in Jesus Christ, have said, I will not be that way anymore. I'm going to be special and holy to God. Ephesians 5 talks about the glory of the church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, and he might present to himself the church in all her glory. It's a picture of a wedding. In fact, Revelation, turn to Revelation. Revelation 20, or is it 19? Verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in the fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The glory of the church. Number one, forgiven. Number two, being righteous. That's the kind of glory that we can look around and we can see in each of us. Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So get the picture. In chapter 19, we saw this discussion of a bride marrying the husband, and the bride is the church. Here is a city which we are told is the bride. The city is the church, presumably in the future. Verse 18. Before we read this, ask yourself, men, when you want to tell a woman you love her, other than just saying you love her and treating her the way she ought to be treated, what do you say? What do you do? You run down to Zales or wherever your place is and you get her a big fat diamond ring and you say, this is what you're worth to me. In fact, the Bible does the same thing. A good wife who can find her worth is far above jewels or rubies. Right? The Bible does the same thing. Look, when we want to say, I, I love you, I appreciate you, you are valuable to me, we say it with the things that we understand. Gold, precious. Now listen to this. This city, which we know is the church, verse 18. The material of the wall was jasper. The city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius the seventh chrysolite, the eighth pearl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jessene, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of city was pure gold like transparent glass. Right there, he is saying, this is what you mean to me. I value you. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul prays about these saints. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance. Well, what's that talking about? In the saints. I want you to understand the riches of glory, which are the saints. He's talking about us. Paul says... I want you to understand that God finds you precious in his sight. So the point is this. Don't ever give it up. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Therefore, since we, not those who follow Moses, not those who are agnostics, not those who are atheists, not those who follow Muhammad, not those who follow Buddha, nobody else. We have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Don't you ever let that go. In Acts chapter 2, this word is used of death. 
Death gets somebody and never lets them. Jesus is the only one who couldn't. Everybody else, death gets, and it, it hangs on, and no matter how you try to escape, before Jesus, you couldn't. That's this word right here. Hang on to your confession. Jesus Christ is the one that gets me all these blessings, and I will never let it go. Why would somebody want to? Let's finish with this. Does this sound like me? I am forgiven. I feel no shame for my sin. Yes, when I think about the skeleton in my closet, I have shame. I can't believe I did that. But I am forgiven. I am humble. I am peaceful. What is my attitude toward my brethren? Or my former enemies? I am proud in and rejoicing about the city. I want to tell people about the church that God is in and founded with his son and there are other people who were ugly but now they are forgiven and they're acting beautifully. I want to tell people about this. How about my attitude about the law? We are knowledgeable in the ways of the law. Are we part of that stream? The stream of people, imagine that, going up saying, teach us more of these words. Is that me? The passage that we read in Psalm 87 told us that those who are in the city know the Lord. I know of only one way to know the Lord. And the way I know that is by the scripture. Matthew chapter 7. So we'll see this stated two ways. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. And, in, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Remember from last week or two weeks ago? Jesus, the reason why he was crowned is because he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Well, here he is. Now, they're standing before him, the one who hated lawlessness, and they didn't practice the law, and they say, we knew you. We said we were doing it in your name. Oh, we claim to be Christians, and we said everything we even read, and he says, you didn't obey me. You don't know me. I don't know you. Stated positively over in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter, excuse me, 1 John chapter 2. By this we know that we have come to know him. Remember in Psalm 87, they will know me. Well, how, how will we be able to identify those who know him? If we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And again, he loved righteousness and he hated lawlessness. Does that describe me? If you want to be a member of this community, it's a chosen, it's an elected community. It is the most special community there ever has been and ever will be for eternity. And you can accept his call. We read it today. You have to be born of the water and the spirit. If you want to be introduced into this body, let us know. If you're not this person, if this doesn't sound like you, I know it's gone there, but you know what I'm talking about. If this doesn't sound like you, this, this one in Psalm 87, the one in Isaiah 2, 35, 11, Joel, if this doesn't sound like you, then you need to repeat. Because as we studied this morning, we can lose our salvation and fall away. If you want the prayers or encouragement of the church, let us know as we stand and sing the song that has been chosen.
Oh. 